Amen. Well, it's good to be in the Lord's house, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Let's open our Bibles. We're going to look at a few different passages this morning to John chapter number 3. We'll see how far we make it, right? John chapter number 3. Yeah. John chapter 3. Let's look down at verse number 14. John chapter 3. Verse 14, if you don't have your Bible, we do have it on the screen, but John chapter 3, verse 14, I like to give people time uh, to get there, amen. Let's go ahead and look at God's word in chapter 3 of verse 14 there, it says, and as Moses lift up the serpents in the wilderness, even so must the Son of God, uh, the Son of Man, be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have ever or eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Boy, that just rolls out of your tongue, doesn't it? How many people know that? Amen. Well, that's probably one of the most well-known verses in all the world, isn't it? It better be. Amen. If someone has John 3.16 on their hat or on their t-shirt, we know what that is, right? You better know what it is, amen. And you know what? They quote King James too. Isn't that funny? Verse 17 says, For God sent not his Son. Are you paying attention? For God sent not his Son into the world to what? Condemn the world. But that the world through him might be what? Saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is what? Condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen. Look at verse number uh, uh, 19. And this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world and men love what? Darkness rather than light. Now that's the condemnation. That light comes in the world. And men love darkness rather than, so they, they, they get mad, don't they? You'll understand here in just a minute. And when and men love darkness rather than light because what? Their deeds are evil because you, you don't want the light to shine that you're evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be what? Reproved. They don't like that. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they were wrought in God. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we love you. Lord, we're careful, Lord, knowing that this is the Word of God. And Father, that's why we're here this morning, Lord, to hear from you. And Lord, I pray, Lord, as we prayed yesterday, Lord, I just want to be uh, your man. Lord, I pray that that's all of our prayers. We just want to be your child, Father. We want to do what you want in our life. And Father, I think that sometimes we do the things that we want. Lord, I pray you forgive us. Lord, we want to do and hear and see and say the things that you want in our life. And Father, we love you. We're going to be careful this morning. But Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit of God would have freedom. Lord, we ask to hedge up around this church building, Father, around our hearts and our minds. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't want to hinder anyone this morning from hearing from heaven. Lord, change us in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my message this morning is Rejection for Acceptance. Rejection for acceptance. Amen. I, I don't think I have to tell you anything about what rejection is all about, do I? I don't think that I have to give you some long, drawn-out story about what rejection is all about. We, we kind of read uh, about rejection just a little bit there, didn't we, after John chapter 3 and verse number 16, where he said he didn't come to condemn the world, but that through him the, we wouldn't be condemned, would we? But it says there that those who are condemned are those who don't receive Christ. So they, they, they actually choose condemnation. Amen. And that, that doesn't make any sense. Amen. Uh, but I want you to understand something. Child of God this morning, Christ didn't reject you. Aren't you glad? Rejection, uh, in order to understand rejection, uh, let's look at the meaning of rejection. A rejection is the act of throwing. God didn't throw you away. I, I, this does something for me. 
You know, I, you know, we always have our own plans, not just me. We have our own plans in our head that we think things are going to happen. And uh, I had no idea what I was going to preach this morning, uh, but God did, amen. And I, I remember listening to another preacher on Facebook preaching uh, a message, and the only thing I got from him was a word that he threw out there, rejection. And God began to use that word rejection in my mind, and that's kind of what he does, doesn't he? He began to develop that and, and said, this is what I want you to preach on Sunday. And so I began to write down some things and think about some things. And, man, I've, I've, ha I've been thrown away a, a time or two, haven't you? That don't feel too good, does it? I remember growing up and, uh, and uh, uh, having, uh, even if you think about having a friendship with uh, anybody and thinking that you have a close friendship with them. And then after a while, something happens and that friend is no longer your friend anymore. How does that make you feel? I thought we were besties, right? Isn't that what they say now? Besties, amen. Or I hear a new saying, I, I can't stand it, for real, for real. What in the world? Can we? What do we got to say it twice for, right? Huh? Are you my friend for real, for real? Come on. What in the world? You know, I wonder if my parents, I, obviously they were. Uh, when we were growing up, we had our little words and sayings, didn't we? And I, our parents just, oh, I, don't know, I don't even know who he is, right? <laughs> Can we just talk, amen? Uh, rejection. We don't like it. I'll tell you, the one person you don't want to be rejected from is Christ. But the only way that you can have rejection of Christ is if you choose it yourself. He won't give it to you. You have to choose it. Well, that makes you think about a, a whole other way when you think about lost people, don't, don't it? It should. It's your job to tell them. It's their job to reject it. But Christ doesn't want them to reject it. Amen. We've seen what happens when light comes in the world. They don't like the light because it makes manifest of what? What they're doing was wrong. You know, uh, you say, man, the world is in a wrong way. Come on, help me. Man, our, our government's in a wrong way. Come on, help me. Man, they're trying to do away with our first, third, fourth, and fifth amendments by slipping it in a bill. Boy, our government's in a wrong way. Come on, help me. Come on there. They, you know what I think is even worse? Are those who say they're for us don't even read the bill and sign the bill and say that they're for us. Wait a minute. Why didn't you read it? Well, I had my flunkies read it, and I didn't, they didn't catch it, and they didn't tell me about it, so I signed it. All right, parent. I co-signed on it, but I didn't read the fine print. Well, guess what? Now you're liable for it. Huh. You know, we're in a bad time, aren't we? Let me ask you this. Where's the light been? If you allow the world to be dark for a long time, it's going to get bad. Aren't you supposed to be the light? Where's the light been? Because just like raid chases the bugs away, so does light chase the evil away. So if there is no light and it's dark, we're going to live in a rejected world. I don't like it. I don't like being the wicked one. You know, the world, uh, it's, it's a shame, man. It's a shame. The world is saying that transgender people should, uh, trans uh, men wearing uh, women's clothes should be allowed to show children to their shows. You know what's, it, what's really bad? I had a preacher sharing a testimony from a man wearing all this get up looking like a woman and nasty. And you know, out of his own lips said, no children should come to our shows. Amen. Even the wicked know that they shouldn't have children there. Where's the light? I remember when the light was so bright that you, they were afraid to even say that they were homo this or homo that. Because the light was strong. It wasn't because of the fact that, uh, uh, now there were haters, uh, but those who were saved were shining bright the word of God. I remember a day where if a pastor come into the presence, everybody cleaned up their mouth. Now today, they want to see if they can catch your attention by cussing or saying the Lord's name. 
I remember a day when people put their Bibles in their cars so that people could see they love the Lord. Don't see that anymore. When's the last time you've seen a Bible in a car? I was watching what they used to call live PD the other night, and this lady was pulled over, and uh, the, the officer says, you know why I pulled you over, don't you? And, uh, I mean, she was swimming. You say, what do you mean? Well, there was so much trash in her car, it was all the way up. I mean, she couldn't even see out of the front windshield. There was trash all around her, all up. Wasn't it? The whole car was full of trash. He didn't give her a ticket. He made her go to the gas station down the road and throw that trash out. Amen. Isn't that kind of like our lives? You know, why did she have to be told to throw trash out? I mean, just to sit in her own seat, she would have to push trash aside to sit down. Sounds like the Christian today. Just to live our lives, we have to push the trash aside instead of get it right. What a reflection, right? Do you know what's funny is that the world pulled her over and says, man, don't you see that your car's a trash heap? It's a shame when the wicked ones are looking at us and saying, don't you know this is wicked? Why aren't you calling this out? It's a shame when we have uh, uh, men dressed in women's garments who do those nasty shows and says, uh, you shouldn't have your children here. Where's the light? You say, well, my light's flickering. Shouldn't be. You say, well, I'm too old. <laughs> hey, that's not a, let me tell you something. Uh, a light shines until it's gone. Are you listening to me? Hey, you know, a light bulb shines until it's gone. You don't listen to me. You're not gone yet. And so your light should continue to shine. Huh. Rejection for acceptance. The word rejection is the act of throwing away. It also means to be cast off. Now, think about that for just a minute. It'll come to you. But the Bible says that those who don't accept Christ will be cast off into outer darkness. They choose that. Now, acceptance, on the other hand, I like that word, don't you? Hmm? It means kindly received. <laughs> That's what happened when I got saved. Jesus not only kindly asked me, he kindly received me. And you know when he received me, Miss Rochelle? He used that pen that he used for your name, and he wrote it in the Lamb's book of what? Life. That means I just now got off death row. Amen. And you know while I was rejected, he was still accepting me. Do you know why? Maybe there's someone out there that needs to hear this. You say, man, my past is pretty rough. Maybe someone else needs to hear you say, aren't all of ours? I didn't know how much that meant to the young man I was talking to. But he said, thank you for saying that. You know what we like to do? We like to take some of that stuff and wear it, don't we? Get over it. We're all wicked. All of us, including me, where all our pasts are very wicked. Amen. Praise God for His grace. Let me help you something. When I got saved, Brother David, the Lord accepted me. Man, praise God. I went from rejected to accepted. The word acceptance means kindly received. It means, now think about this. This is an, I didn't even know this when I was putting it here, but isn't it neat how I, I find it fascinating that when I'm preaching, the things that God gives me to write down, I'm like, oh, that's why I wrote it down. Amen. It, it, it's pretty neat, isn't it? Amen. As you're reading the Bible, you're like, oh, that's why I'm reading that this morning, right? When you come to Bible study, oh, that's why, that's why I'm coming to Bible study, right? When you come to church and the message is being preached, oh, that's why I'm supposed to go to church. Hello. When we're, when we're following the Lord, God shows us why he has us do the things we do. Acceptance means regarded. I like that. I like that I'm regarded. It means covered. I'm covered. I don't know about you, whenever I think of the word covered, I think of the Passover, don't you? It's the same thing. They put the Passover blood over the door and they were covered. 
child of God, when you received Christ, you got the blood of the Lamb over you. And you're covered, friend. The Bible says that when you become saved, you receive Christ's garments of righteousness. And so you're covered with the blood of Christ. The word acceptance means that you, uh, it means agreed to. Isn't that awesome? So when you come to the Lord and believe for salvation, you agreed to be a part of his family. You're accepted. Amen. I love that. It also reminds me of the prodigal son, don't it, you? You know, he left because he thought he was going to have more fun with the, his acceptance or his, his inheritance. And, and then when he went back, he went back and he, he felt like he was going to be rejected. Was he rejected? No, he wasn't. He was accepted. And he was received. Now, I want you to look with me, if you would, to John chapter 13. And verse number 16. We're going to look through here in the book of John. We have several places here in John I want you to look to. And these are interesting things. John chapter 13 and verse number 16. And let's see what God's going to do for us here in the word of God. If you're there, say amen. <clears throat> verse number 16 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Now this is the Lord speaking. It says, The servant is not greater than his what? Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Now, I want you to understand something here. Uh, the Lord is saying that uh, we're not greater. The, the key here, I want you to see here, that we're not greater than our Lord. Come on now. Jesus, now, we were talking about this just this week, me and my wife. We're talking about how God laid everything down to come in the flesh in a form of a man. And he wasn't even handsome to boot, the Bible says. It wasn't comely. And he dropped everything to come down here to this old world. Now, let me help you something. When it's talking about how we're not greater than the Lord, it's talking about what Jesus went through. You're not greater than him. For all those who listen to those prosperity preachers, uh, you better knock that off because that's not what Jesus went through. We're not greater than our Lord. Jesus had it rough, didn't he? He had it rough, amen. I, I remember him praying at, at the Garden of Gethsemane and he says if not, if, it, if, uh, uh, he, was, if he could take this bitter cup from me, this bitter cup from me. Bitter we're not greater than our Lord. Can I tell you something? That if you're not saved this morning, you cannot call him your Lord yet. You can't say that. Uh, you can't say that. But those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we can say that. Hey, I am not greater than my Lord. Now look at chapter 15. Notice we're going in succession here. Go to chapter 15 and verse number 13. Look at chapter 15 and verse number 13. This, these are great things to know, amen. Look at chapter 15 and verse number 13. I love looking in the Gospels, don't you? I especially love the book of John. But look at verse 13. Notice that very first word. Do you see it? It says, greater love hath no man than this. Now, you should have this verse memorized. He's talking about you, buddy. He's talking about you, ma'am. He's talking about you, sir. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his what? Friends. I like that. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Are you following Henceforth, I call you not what? Wait a minute. We transformed from servants to friends. Child of God, I'm a friend of God. Notice he says, if you pay attention here, if you'll listen to the word of God here, he says there that ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Do you know that's proof of friendship? Right. How many have friends that you don't ever talk to? Not very good friends though, right? I haven't talked to my brother in 27 years. And when I seen him, he grabbed me around the neck and just cried. And we cried together. But let me help you with this. I did not know him. Is he my friend? Yeah, he's my brother. He is my friend. That's my brother. 
How can you not be my friend? I don't know him. Do you know the Bible says that Satan believes and trembles? He knows Jesus. He was friends with Jesus. But they're not friends. They're enemies. You know the difference between a friend and a friend, right? I have acquaintances. They're not really my friends. I also have ones that call themselves my friends. Come on, help me with this. And I've gotten more arrows than I've gotten help. What I've learned in the ministry is to be careful those who call you their friend. Here's something else I've learned in the ministry. I'm just trying to help you. Those who say they have your back are the ones who will stab you. Just being honest, right? Yeah. Some people have told me that one of the great things they like about me is I'm real. Yeah, but real people get hurt the most. People who are accepting get hurt the most. I spent a lot of time in tears. So did Christ. I'm glad he calls me his friend, Rochelle. Are you his friend? The Bible said the friends are the ones who do whatever he commanded. Do you know that? Let me help you with this. I'm not trying to step on your toes. Can I love you? You'll be at church because he commands it. You'll be at Bible study. Come on. There won't be a problem. The Bible says those who are his friends do what I command you. You say, well, I've got excuses. Do you know excuses won't work? They didn't work for Moses. They won't work for you. Notice here it says, greater love hath no man than this, than the man that laid down his life for his friends. You know what he's saying? He says, I, I loved you so much, I'm going to die for you. Notice verse 14, ye are my friends, he confirms it, if you do whatsoever I command you. Notice he says it again, doesn't he? Look at 15, and he says, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You know what he's saying? I've told you everything that I know. You are my friends, I love you. You have not chosen me, well, that's apparent, but I have chosen you and have ordained you, means he given you the power, that ye should go and bring forth what? Huh. Where's your fruit? And that your fruit should what? Remain. You know what? Let me ask you something. Boy, that's a message in itself, isn't it? Child of God, if you're really his friend, you'll have fruit. And when you go on to be with the Lord, your fruit will be there to remain. Are you following me? Come on, help me. Right? Do you know that that's why trees leave? You know, I love red oaks, but I wish I would have got seedless red oaks. Amen? Help me. I wish you all would have told me, don't plant red oaks unless you get seedless red or whatever. Amen? Uh, I know the other ones have some kind of fruit, but they don't drop nuts all over your yard so that you can't walk on it. Ow. When you got squirrels, you're like, bring the squirrels by the tons, amen. Get these nuts out of here, right? Because they don't rake out of Bermuda grass, by the way. Huh. You know, they say a good sign of a healthy red oak tree is lots of nuts. Sounds like the Baptist church, right? Lots of nuts, right? Amen, you'll get it. You'll get that later, amen. Uh, lots of nuts, amen. Hey, you know what? Why do they drop those things? Why would they reproduce? Because they're not going to live forever. How many nuts do you think that red oak tree drops? Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of every season. I'm so thankful. I'm just thinking about having a, I'm going to put down this no grow thing, and I'm just going to have nuts. I'm going to have the nut yard, right? <laughs> Sounds like the church fellowship, right? We're going to have a nut yard, right? Amen. Uh, but you know what's neat about that? That means my red oak tree is healthy. Do you know what they say? If it stops putting off nuts, there's a problem. Are you listening? 
Do you know the Lord makes reference to us as trees of Lebanon? He calls us trees. What are you going to leave? Don't you be saying, well, I'm hoping the Lord comes back. That's a lame excuse. The Bible even said, why ye men of Galilee stand ye gazing? We're not to be gazing. We're supposed to be. Someone said, wait till you have great grandchildren. You'll love them even more. But I want them to know the Lord. I hope my grandson is a preacher. He has a lot of years left. I hope my granddaughter marries a preacher. I hope they're Baptists. I hope my other granddaughter marries a preacher. Why? Because there's not enough. There's a lot of discouraged men. Do you know it's easy to get discouraged when you get your eyes off the source? Come on, help me. When you're around all the complaining and the complaints, it's hard to keep focus, isn't it? I'm so thankful the Lord called me his friend. The word friend there means one who is attached to another with affection. Now, he had the affection towards us. We didn't have any towards him. For God so loved the world, don't you remember? Not that you loved him. The word friends is a promoting of another's happiness and companionship. He sure wants to do that for you. Amen. You say, how in the world did Paul write half of the New Testament in prison and have joy? Go read some of his prison epistles, how he starts out, and he starts out blessing the church and so happy to be a minister of God and in such grace and joy and thankfulness. How can you be thankful in misery? That's God. That's God. Number one, I want you to turn over to Mark chapter 6. Matthew, Mark chapter 6. The second book of the New Testament. Look there with me if you would. Look at verse number 1. These are all amazing. I want you to see this is the life of Christ. Look at Matthew or Mark chapter 6. Are you there? Not very far away, but look at verse number 1. We're just going to read the first six verses, but look at verse number one. It says, And he went out from thence and came into his own country, talking about Jesus. And his disciples followed him, or follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is uh, this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands. Man, they're astonished, aren't they? Is not this, the, oh, here's where it comes. Is not this the, what? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Hoses and Judah and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And now listen, and they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work to save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. Boy, he must have been Texan, amen. Uh, right? Look at verse 6. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went round about the villages teaching. I want to look at some rejection, amen. Remember, we've already talked about how uh, the servant or his friends are no greater than the Lord. Now, understand this. The title of my, my, my message is Rejection uh, for Acceptance. Now, the, most, the thing that our heart desires is for His acceptance. Amen? Let me help you with this. Don't try to receive acceptance from where you're not supposed to receive it. But know that you are going to be rejected for it. Jesus Christ received his acceptance from God the Father, and he received rejection, now number one, from friends and family. Isn't that sad? 
The first place that we're going to receive rejection is from our friends and family. Our friends and family. Notice it says in verse number 1, And he came into his own country. He went to his own town. Uh, it starts at home. You know, when you start doing something for the Lord, you know your rejection starts at home. You mind if I share a testimony about us? Okay, sometimes I don't ask, and sometimes that's kind of rude, but because she's always part of it, amen. I remember uh, when we were first together, and I finally decided, you know, I'm going to start going to church again, right? <laughs> After I got a whooping, not from her, from the Lord, amen. She couldn't whoop me, she couldn't catch me, she catch me, I'm fast, right? Not, well, I'm faster now, for sure. But, uh, but anyways, uh, <laughs> anyways I, I remember knowing that, you know, she was like, well, we need to start doing family devotions. Right? Duh. Right? Well, if you're going to be full-time ministry, don't you think it should be family devotions? My wife would keep nudging me, and I was like, I know, I know, I know. But you just, I'm going to help you. I'd never had those before. Come on. Don't lie. I've never had those before. I know how to do that. My wife kept on nudging me. And it wasn't just her nudging me. The Lord was nudging me. He started doing family devotions. I don't know how to do that. How in the world are you going to be a pastor if you can't do family devotions? Right? So, all right, we're going to do family devotions. Right? That's how we get all right, we're doing family devotions. It's my decision. My wife didn't tell me. We're doing family devotions. We're doing them, we're doing them after dinner. Hurry up, get ready, get out your Bible. Come on over here. I'm reading the Bible, you know, and I, I'm not really understanding what I'm reading because I'm not really right with God. And I'm trying to explain what I'm reading, and my wife goes, well, doesn't it mean this? I'm like, you better hush. <laughs> I didn't say that. I just looked at her. Who's doing this Bible study, me or you, right? Isn't it funny that when you're not doing things right, how you get so angry? Yeah. Now I'm feeling rejected from her. The rejection was I wasn't right with God. You want to know you're not doing family devotions? Because you're not right with God. Do you want to know why you can't pray? You don't want to pray? You want to pray in public? You don't want to pray around anybody? You want to pray at church? There's a heart problem. If you can't pray in front of the church family, how are you praying at home? How can you have a relationship? Right? I'm sorry if that hurts. I'm, I just want to be your pastor. And Can I tell you that rejection always feels like it comes from our friends and family? But let me help you with this. Usually the rejection a Christian feels is because of the fact he's not right with God. I want you to understand something, that just because they didn't receive him in his own country, it said that he still went around teaching there. He didn't want them to have an excuse. Come on, excuses don't win. So his family knew. Can I give you a little heads up on what happened to his family? James became the first pastor of the Jerusalem church. He rejected Christ. Yeah, he did. Until the resurrection. What are we waiting on? What are we waiting on? Here we see an excuse, friends and family. Huh. Do you know what I find interesting? Verse number 2, he says, He began to teach, and many hearing him were astonished. And, and notice they were astonished because of the mighty works. They weren't astonished really about his knowledge, about Christ, about God, about anything. But they sure were astonished by his what? His works. Huh. What kind of man is he? Can you imagine what's going on? Let me help you with that. I want you to understand something. When you start living your life right for the Lord and you're not focusing on what your friends and family are saying about you, keep your focus on God because guess who's going to come griping and complaining when everything's going right for you because you're right with God? They're going to say, why in the world would you tithe to the church? And Why would you give your money? Why would you go to... Uh, what, what, no, is, that, is that a crutch? 
Let me tell you something. The Lord gave me eternal life. I don't think that's a crutch. You know, I like it. It says in verse number three, is not this the carpenter? Doesn't that sound like the family and friends? Huh? I remember when I finally surrendered to preach, uh, my friend said, isn't that the guy that was out with us just last Friday night drinking? Isn't that the guy that bought all the rounds? Hey, isn't that the guy that was just cussing and smoking cigarettes? Right? Come on, help me. Huh? Huh? Isn't that the carpenter? That's just Jesus. That's just Brother David. Don't pay attention to him. Oh, they'll pay attention to him. They'll pay attention to you if you keep your focus on the Lord. Don't you worry about what your friends and family are saying. Shame on them. Hey, I've got some like that in my family. It sickens me. It sickens me because they know better. But let me tell you something, because they're going to sit there and back talk me and behind my ear and behind my and, and try to antagonize my children and everything else. Just because they do that, let me tell you something, that just makes me more fired up to do what the Lord wants me to do. Man, I wanted to call them and tell them, leave my kids alone. Haven't you done enough damage? Let me help you. Don't focus on them. Focus on the Lord. Remember, you're accepted. You're not rejected. Don't feel that rejection from them. Let me tell you something. Satan likes to use things and people to make you feel rejected. Can I tell you something? If you feel unworthy this morning, it's not because you're unworthy. It's because you're feeling rejection from the world or from friends or from family. That rejection doesn't come from Christ. He's accepted you. Huh. I wrote this. The people that you would think would give you praise and encouragement... Friends and family, right? Isn't that nice? Huh? I've heard family say, we'll see. Right? Have you ever heard that? Man, thanks for the encouragement, right? I've even had, come on, it's also friends. I've had preachers say, well, we'll just see how it works out for you. What? If the Lord's calling is to do this, are you listening? If the Lord's calling is to do this and you're going to say, we'll see how it works out for you, someone's got a problem, right? We have too many churches that are saying, hey, we'll see how that works out for you. Well, it works out pretty good if you follow God. Amen. There's your answer. You want to answer? There you go. It works out pretty good if you follow the Lord. Notice what the Lord says in verse number 4 of Mark chapter 6. It says, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country. The word honor means esteem, respect, reverence. He didn't get any respect or reverence in his own community, with his own family, with his own friends. Come on. It's not unusual. Remember this, something that I've learned. The hardest to win are friends and family. Even Jesus seen that. But know this, that his bro brothers eventually followed. But you know how they followed? Not because of they had that great relationship while Jesus was in the ministry, but because they seen what Jesus did. Are you following me? You know, the one thing that will... And I, I'm sure my daughter won't care if I share this. One of the greatest testimonies I've ever heard from my family is this. The reason why we went back to church is because we've seen your faithfulness, Dad, in it. That's a good testimony. I'm not, I'm not propping that for me. I'm saying that was earth shattering. I heard another testimony the other day on Facebook. And he said, well, if Brother Worley shares it, then I know it's true. Wow. Wow. Come on, you should be hearing that. I've received rejection. Let me tell you something, a life of ministry is a life of rejection. But we don't have to receive that. I've received acceptance. 
I don't have to live in the rejection zone. Those who are rejecting me aren't rejecting me. They're rejecting Christ. Just so you know, if we were on the same team, why are they throwing stones, friend? I'm not going to go befriend someone who's throwing stones at me while I'm trying to plow the plow of the work of the Lord. Let me tell you something. Encourage me. Amen. If you say you're a so-called preacher or a so-called Christian, quit throwing stones. I know it hurts. You know, we moved here, we were nobodies. I'm not a pedigree. My dad was a bus route captain. I'm not a pedigree. I don't have any preachers in my family. I have a deacon. I don't have any preachers in my family. I'm the preacher in the family. Amen. Maybe there'll be preachers that'll be get after me. I don't know. I'm not pedigree. You know, that's not, that's not liked in the ministry. They like to see pedigrees. Do you know what I like to see? I like to see God do a work, don't you? Do you know how many preachers I've seen come from a bus route? That's a minority now because there's not many going. Do you know how many preachers we see come out of the bus route and they become powerful? Do you know what testimony I like to hear the most? I have a dark past. It wasn't by chance, talking to Brother David Striegel, that he said my past is pretty dark. Good. Amen. Praise God. That means God took him out of some darkness. Because we're in it. He's aware of the darkness. Let me ask you this. Would you rather counsel with somebody that's went through something or somebody that's never been through a thing? See, I want a preacher whose pedigree has never, ever uh, touched alcohol, never touched a cigarette, never cussed, never been around that environment. Well, you go for it because they don't really know how to counsel you either. If you want that kind of preacher, you're at the wrong, wrong place. i got a pretty shaky past. And I'm thankful I'm out of it. And God showed me through all those tragedies how I can help others. Can't really help someone else if you haven't received hope from something that you've went through yourself, can you? You know, I can understand now how to counsel someone who's lost a child. The list goes on and on. I can help someone who has seen their kids go to jail. What have you gone through? Have you allowed to live in rejection over it? Or are you going to live through acceptance in it? The acceptance of Christ. You're not accepting them and what they're doing. You're accepting what God has called you to do. The hardest to win are your friends and family. Look at Luke chapter 4. I want you to see this. We're not going to close until I get through this. Luke chapter 4. Look at 28 through 30. Luke chapter 4 verses 28 through 30. I want you to see this. It's amazing. Remember, Jesus is steering Nazareth here. But look at here, and uh, this is just actually a, another view of what we've already read. This is from Luke. But look at verse number 28. It says, and all they in the, in the what? Uh, what's that? What? Let, let, hold on. Let, let's get this right. All they in the synagogue or the church, when they heard these things, were filled with what? What in the world? And rose up and thrust him out of the city. I don't know why this makes me kind of get upset. And they led him unto the brow of the hill huh, where on the city was built. You know, Jesus was healing folks, loving folks. He wasn't only healing them physically, but he was trying to heal them spiritually. And here we have the religious leaders. That's my number two. Here we have those who say that they know the Bible, those that are supposed to be encouraging and winning people to the Lord, taking the very God from heaven and being angry because He's doing what they have been proclaiming. And notice in verse 29, He says, They took Him to the brow of the hill whereon the city was built that they might cast Him down headlong. They wanted to throw Him off on His head. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. 
you know what? Jesus wasn't afraid of them. I'm not either. We got a lot of religious folk. Do you know what I call them? Judaizers. That's what these were. Pharisees, Sadducees. Now you know why they were sad. Because they didn't receive Christ. Amen. Uh, they're really sad now because they're in a place called hell. Amen. And they're waiting to be thrown into the lake of fire after they stand before the great white throne judgment. You know what? They live an angry, rejected life because they've never received acceptance. Let me help you. I'll tell you how to walk by those religious leaders. You do it just like Jesus did because he's accepted by God the Father. You know what? They're angry because he's doing what they should be doing shame on them because of the fact that we already seen that the light has lit up their darkness and their evil works and all they can do is think of casting stones I'm telling you what to do you just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing you walk on right by them and you keep your head up high bunch of pious losers what are they doing for, let me ask you this, why do they have time to talk bad about me? What in the world? I'm not, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about you too. What do they have so much time to talk about you for? Why do they do something for the Lord themselves? You know what the church has done? Anybody have a gun this morning? You know what you're always told not to do? Not to have one in the chamber if you have your gun in your pocket. Because if you grab your gun in your pocket and you accidentally hit that trigger, where's it going to hit? Have you ever hurt your foot? That's probably the most painful place to get hurt. Ask my wife. If you've never been hit in the foot with a sledgehammer or a, or a sewer lid cap or a desk, you know what the church has done? They've shot themselves in the foot. Because we've rejected people to death. Well, let's take all those who really love the Lord and let's just throw them off a cliff. Well, that makes sense. Huh? Well, they don't believe like we do. Let's just throw them out of here. Let's throw them off the... Now, I'm not talking about accepting their false doctrine. I'm all about showing them in the Word of God how they're wrong and then they have to make that choice. I'm not throwing anybody off a cliff. Amen? I'm also not talking about accepting their wrongness. Too many of us don't want to hear the truth, so we want to throw the truth out. Are you following me? That's what's happening. Remember, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Notice, he says, I am the way, truth, and life. Interesting thing. They want to get rid of the way, the truth, and and the life. Do you know if you get rid of that, you're going to hell, friend. They wanted to get rid of him because he made them look bad. Hmm. You know, we read this earlier tonight, too, that just like Moses raised the serpent up, it said, So shall the Son of Man be raised up, talking about Christ on the cross. Praise God for that. Let's look at number three, and we'll close here. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Can I tell you this? We're not getting, it's not getting better, is it? It's getting worse, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so I want you to understand something. All these things and that feeling of rejection isn't going to get better. It's going to get worse. It is. Amen. And uh, you ever hear that saying, if the going gets tough, the tough get going? Amen. Uh, you know, and spiritually, we've got to toughen up. Amen. We've got to keep going. We can't shut our mouths. We've got to proclaim Christ. Now, we don't have to be, uh, I, I don't really agree with some of the haters out there who are trying to cram the word of God down people's throat. That's not how you do it. Amen. Why don't you live the life and proclaim it in your life? Why don't you you live godly all the time. Amen. Hey, guess what? The best testimony is your life. You know, those who say, uh, boy, if it wasn't for your faithfulness, I wouldn't be. Are you hearing me? Look at Matthew chapter 8, verse number 28. Just want to read just a few verses here. Are you there? And it says, and when he was come to the other side of into the country of Gergesenes, uh, there met him, notice, how many? Two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, 
exceeding fierce. There's that word, amen, exceeding fierce. Amen. So that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Meaning that it's not time for you to come. Amen. Look at verse 30. And there was a good way off from them and herd of swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go the way into the herd. Now who's choosing the swine? The devils are. Jesus didn't say, oh, they're swine. I'm going to throw them in the swine. No, he let them make their own choice, didn't he? Isn't that neat how the Lord is? Now, pay attention here. It says, and he said unto them, go. And when they were come out, notice that's all he said, go. What do you mean go? Go to the swine. You made the choice. Get on going. You better go, right? God didn't have to say much, did he? And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in waters. Now, notice in verse 33, And they, they that kept them fled, the shepherds. And they went their ways into the city. And they told everything and what was befallen to the possessed devils. Now, now pay attention to the reaction. And behold, the what? The whole city came out to meet Jesus. Well, isn't that blessing? It's time to have a preaching service, right? No, pay attention. And when they saw him, they besought him, and they would depart. They, 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 they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. What's going on here? What's going on here? Jesus just took care of a problem is what's going on here. We have two men. Come on, they have demons in them. It said that they were fierce. And they wouldn't let people go to and from. And no one could, just so you know, a demon-possessed man, we've already seen once before, they can break chains. They were running around naked. They were living in the tombs. And they were, they, that was scary. You want to talk about scary, not Hollywood movie. But a demon-possessed man, that's scary. A truly demon-possessed man. Except for there was two demon possessed men notice i want you to understand something else i find miraculous as soon as jesus comes into town where do they go to jesus notice do they try to cast jesus out no they go right where they belong on their face oh lord what are you coming here for lord you're coming before you're supposed to come uh, lord don't 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 put us in hell amen uh, put us in put us in no guess what they know they can go to the bottom they know they can go to the bottom of the pit just so you know, hell and the bottomless pit are two separate things. The, the angels aren't in hell yet. Those who have been cast, do you know they've been cast in the bottomless pit and they're locked in there right now? We talked about that in Revelation. They're like, Lord, don't put us in the bottomless pit. We don't want to. They know where they can go. Go Put us in the swine if you're going to put us in anything. Wow, that's some respect, isn't it? Uh, you know, if the, if the devil's respect Jesus don't you think we should amen I mean I want to help you with something here if we had walked with the true power of God don't you think those people that are acting like that would understand that and see that but I want you to see the rejection from the people number three the wicked people we're gonna receive rejection through wicked wicked people Notice it says, and the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. I'm amazed at that, aren't you? Huh? It reminds me of a time where we uh, went and we met with my grandparents. I know they, they could be family. I don't know if they were family, but these are wicked people. I remember we met with my grandparents, and somehow or another church got brought up. And uh, my parents began to talk to them about church. My, my grandparents were going to a Mormon church, and my grandma had left the Baptist church, and they were trying to get, make sense of that. And so they, were, they really, really had a longing to talk to them about it. I mean, I was just a little kid, but I was there. But she, as they began to talk about it, and they began to bring up scripture, there began to be some heat. And the heat came from my grandma and my grandpa. And my eyes got that big. Because I'd never seen my grandma act like that. And they cast us out. And us kids were scared. 
we're never going to see our grandparents again. They told us not to call them. I know rejection hurts. It does. But because of the rejection that Christ received, we're accepted. We're accepted. Let me tell you something. I had the opportunity, which I couldn't do. I had to have my wife when my grandpa was on his deathbed. I was crying too much. But I love my grandpa. She was able to ask him if he knew Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. If he ever asked him into his heart, he was able to say yes. Do you know, that's what I want to remember the most. I don't want to remember their anger and hatred towards that. Right? You know what? Let me help you with something. We need to take all that rejection that we've had from whoever it is that we've had it from. We need to give that to the Lord because he's accepted us in Christ. We need to continue living a life of Christ. Jesus has given us an example, hasn't he? They wanted to throw him out of the city. Hey, guess what? When they get ready to throw Lighthouse Baptist Church out of this city, I'm just going to be praising Jesus all the way out. Why? Because if that's the Lord's will, right? Help me. If my family wants to kick me out of the family for preaching Christ, I'm just going to be praising Jesus. Not because I hate my mother and my father. Not because I hate my family. But because I love Jesus more. Why? Because he's my God. He died for me. He gave me eternal life. Guess what? Let me help you with something. Let me help you understand something. If you're saved today, you're my family. You know who my family is? You. That's what Jesus said, isn't it? Those who do the will of my Father, they're my family. They're my friends. You know, you say, man, my family's pretty rough. No, it's not. I know I'm rough, but I still love you. We're your family. We say, I don't have any family. Yeah, you do. We're right here. What are we? Mince meat? Amen. Are we baloney? No. We love you. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. My wife's going to play a verse invitation. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't know what you're going through this morning. But let me tell you this one thing before you come to the altar. Let me tell you this one thing. Notice, we get acceptance through his rejection. Know this, that you're no greater, you're no greater than the Lord. If he's going to be rejected, so will you. But the, let me help you with this one thing. They're not really rejecting you. If you're living for the Lord, they're rejecting him. I'm so thankful for his acceptance. I'll receive that every day, every day. I don't know what you have on your shoulders. I don't know what you have on your plate. But I do know, Christian and child of God, Satan is going to use rejection in your life to stop you from doing what you know you're supposed to do. You know who you are. Will you get it right with him? He's up here today. He's not condemning you. He's saying, come home. Will you come home? Will you come home? Will you get it right with me? Will you let me handle the situation? As she plays, no one's looking around. Will you join me at the altar? Lord, I'm sorry, Father. I've been living in a life of rejection. Will you forgive me? Will you come?
say, man, they don't like me. If you're doing what the Lord asks you to do, you know, I'm not telling you to be unlikable. Not everybody likes me. And that's the, that's weird, huh? Everybody should like me, right? Isn't that what you think? Not everybody likes me. I'm so thankful that as long as I'm right with the Lord, I'm telling you, when you are right with God, you feel it, don't you? You're happier, aren't you? I'm happier. I'm accepted. You know, when I, when I really am right with the Lord, I don't really care how hateful and angry you are. Are you following me? It's hard, though, isn't it? I don't like it when someone I love is like that, right? What a hard thing. Well, praise the Lord. Let's close in a word of prayer. I will encourage you to be back again at 4 o'clock. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, for your word. Father, we're thankful, Lord, as we looked at your life. And Father, we see all the rejection that you received and you just continued. And what, a, what an example, Father. And Lord, we don't receive near, near the rejection. Father, we've actually rejected you. And Father, I pray, Lord, as we've looked at this, Lord, as children of God, Lord, that we'd understand, Lord, as long as we keep our eyes on you, be right with you, live in a life of acceptance. Lord, that's what we desire. Father, we know there's others that are looking at us, Father, throwing stones or whatnot, but Lord, we just keep our focus on you. And Father, we're thankful, Lord, for that from you. Father, we're thankful for your love. Father, I pray, Lord, you go with each and every one of us this afternoon. Lord, bring us back again at 4 o'clock. And, Lord, we pray you'd be with us during that time. Lord, reveal the word of God to us again. Father, we'd be careful to thank you and praise you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.